Okay. Thank you for joining us for our program tonight on the Food Mood Connection. We're really pleased to talk about this topic right now as we're all spending more time at home and cooking more and, and dealing with lots of challenging things. So I thought this topic would be very relevant. Uh, our speaker tonight is Evie Schweig. Um, Evie is a certified holistic health coach with degrees in biology and integrated nutrition. She has been working with clients from all over the United States, serving as their personal guide to achieving a more energy-filled, pain-free lives. So welcome, Evie. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Welcome, everybody. I hope everybody is doing well. Um, today's topic is very appropriate given our current environment. I think we've all been feeling a little bit stressed, a little bit, uh, our moods have been fluctuating a lot over this past year. Um, so hopefully this evening, these, this talk will be beneficial to you as well. But before we get started, I just wanted to see, there was another poll that Roz uh, is going to post or has or will post, um, just to see how are you guys feeling this evening? Let's take a little, little poll on that, a little temperature gauge from everybody. All right, we've got some positives and happies, some stressed, sure, content, calm. Wonderful. All right. Well, I'm seeing a lot of very positivity, a lot of positivity going there, and that is great. I'm so glad to hear that because given the, the, the time, as I said, there's a lot of things going on. So you must be doing a lot of things right. So there's a lot of things that contribute to um, our moods. Um, as I mentioned, the environmental, right? What's going on around us can affect us. Uh, stress can uh, affect our mood. It can affect our sleep and sleep allows us to balance and help us with mood and, and adapting to things. Um, the amount of exercise we get also helps with the endorphins, those hormones that help us feel good. Hormone levels in general can affect us, especially women. It with the, during times of, during their cycle. Uh, I'm sure I can tell you it, it really does affect your mood. But tonight what we're going to talk about is a topic that's near and dear to me as a health coach, and that is about healthy foods and foods that can affect your mood and foods that generally can make you feel happy. So food has a lot to do with mood, as I said. So have you ever heard, let me just share my screen here and get that going. And we'll get the slideshow going. So as I mentioned, these are the things that influence our mood. And these are different expressions that I was wondering if you've heard before. What's your gut reaction? Listen to your gut. When you're nervous or stressed, do you get a nervous stomach? Do you sometimes feel butterflies in your stomach? Well, there's a very good reason why we have these reactions. And that's because there really is a very specific connection between our gut, our stomach, our digestive system, and the brain. So our guts do a lot more than just digesting. In fact, the gut contains over a hundred million different nerves. That's more than what's in the spinal cord. And 90% of these nerve endings in the gut connect directly to the brain. So we really want to keep our gut happy. So tonight what I wanna to talk about is the different types of moods that we have. One can be categorized as a short-term mood, uh, which Sometimes it means, you know, you're just feeling grumpy for the day or maybe hangry. Maybe you're hungry and you're getting a little angry. So you're hangry versus long-term, which describes more your attitude in life. It's your, your lifelong attitude, um, whether your glass is half full or whether your glass is half empty type of person. So let's look at that short-term mood. Oh, by the way, I wanted to mention these slides will be available. Roz can send those out to you tomorrow with follow-up. Uh, and 
everything that's on here will be included on the slides. So you don't have to worry about taking mess, uh, notes as we go along. I'm gonna try to move quickly so we have time to do some fun cooking. So short-term mood are affected by our sugar levels. So this really is a direct reaction to what we're eating during the day. If you're eating a lot of sugary foods, you probably find that you're feeling very much like this guy on the left here. Very happy, very energetic. But what might happen is very shortly thereafter, you might find that those energy levels fall, that maybe you're starting to get a little moody, maybe a little weepy even. Um, maybe you're having a hard time focusing or just downright tired. There's a reason for this. The reason is when you eat high sugary foods, they get processed quickly. The body sees that your blood sugar levels are up and it wants to do something with that sugar so it stores it very quickly. And when that happens, your blood sugar levels plummet. So the whole day you've got a cycle like this of your highs with sugar and your lows when you're, you're without. When you're down here, your body says, I need more sugar. So you eat more sugar and you go up, you go down, you go up, you go down. I wonder how many of you out there have had this experience. I know I certainly have. Uh, now that I understand a little bit more about how to affect my mood, it doesn't happen as often. But how can you avoid this, right? That's what we wanna know. So for short term, term mood fluctuations like this, the trick is, to avoid those added sugars. So added sugars are found in a lot of processed foods, along with a lot of processed carbohydrates that get easily broken down into sugars in our body. So we wanna avoid those high sugary foods and replace them instead with foods, whole foods that are naturally high in complex carbohydrates, as opposed to those simple carbohydrates that break down into sugars, healthy fats, and fiber. Those are the things that are going to keep our mood level throughout the day. And here's an example of some of those foods. We have our green leafy vegetables. We have our root vegetables, things that have healthy fats like avocados or nuts are good for us as well, high fiber. And again, these things of the slide I will send to you. So you'll be able to see that later on. So we talked about short-term mood. Let's look at long-term mood. Foods that help long-term mood are foods that help us balance our hormones, fight inflammation, support brain function, and feed a healthy microbiome. So let's look at these individually. Let's take a look at the hormones. Now I mentioned the endorphins that were released when you exercise. There's also serotonin. Serotonin is described as our feel good hormone. So the more ser serotonin that we have floating around in our blood, the happier our mood. It turns out that serotonin communicates happy messages to the brain and it facilitates that connection between the gut and the brain along that vagus nerve that gut brain connection. It's interesting that almost every single antidepressant that's out there works to increase the serotonin levels in the body or keep the serotonin in the brain for a longer period of time. But it's better to get serotonin naturally, right? So it turns out that 90% of the serotonin in the body is found right here in the gut. So we wanna work on getting those foods to get more serotonin. And how do we do that? Well, we need to find foods that are high in tryptophan, B vitamins, and magnesium. Why? Because tryptophan is the precursor for serotonin. It's actually an amino acid and it gets broken down into serotonin in the body. So we need that tryptophan to do that. And here are some of our tryptophan related foods that help us. So tryptophan is found a lot in animal products. So you'll find it in meat. I'm sure you've heard tryptophan being um, noted as something during Thanksgiving that's found in Turkey that makes us sleepy after eating. Well, it is a calming. Serotonin, serotonin is our, our happy um, hormone and helps calm us. 
So it's no surprise. It's also because we eat a lot during Thanksgiving too, but that's another story. But so you can find it in your eggs and your and in dairy products such as yogurt. But there are also uh, vegetarian sources, one of which is dark chocolate. I know everybody's glad to hear that, right? Well, it's actually the cacao or the cocoa that is in a chocolate bar. So it's dark chocolate that we're looking for. The darker, the better. Because once you start talking about milk chocolate and less uh, of the chocolate and more sugars, you're adding in that sugar that we talked about that's not so good, or maybe some unhealthy fats. But things like that, lentils are also a good source of tryptophan. Lentils and pumpkin seeds. And we're actually going to include lentils in one of the dishes that we're doing tonight. So I talked about B vitamins. We need B vitamins because they help facilitate the transition of tryptophan, tryptophan into serotonin. So here are some sources of the B vitamins. So B12 basically is found in, again, animal products. You're gonna find it again in those meats. Um, it's found in fish which is particularly good for you for other reasons, we'll mention later on as well, and dairy. So those things keep coming up. You also, there's some, some sources of B12 in um, plant-based, but mostly in the animal um, food products. Folate, when you think of folate, think of beans and greens. That's where you're gonna find your folate. And B6 is basically found in your grains and starchy vegetables. So a couple of things keep coming up. Um, those pumpkin seeds keep coming up. Avocado keeps coming up. Uh, fish keeps coming up. Poultry, all of these things are so good for us. Tonight, we're going to be cooking with lentils and tomatoes, which are listed there as well. So keep looking for those foods in your diet. And then finally, magnesium. Magnesium is also necessary for serotonin to develop. The problem with that with magnesium is when we get stressed, okay, so when our mood is, is changing, magnesium gets depleted. So we constantly need to be adding magnesium to our diet. And the standard American diet right now, we find that a lot of people are depleted in this very essential mineral. So we need to find it through food sources. And again, here are some examples of how to get it. Again, Green leafy vegetables keep coming up. Pumpkin seeds keep coming up. That dark chocolate in the, whoops, excuse me there. That dark chocolate in the bottom right here keeps coming up. I know we're all glad to see that. Lentils are also good for this. Spinach as well. And if you're not eating your uh, magnesium, you can actually get magnesium through an Epsom salt bath, which is a very calming bath to take at night and helps you sleep better too. So we talked about the hormones, hormone making serotonin. Now let's talk about inflammation. Inflammation has been found to have a high correlation with depression. So one way to fight the inflammation in our body, which is just a regular reaction of our body to the cellular processes that go on every day. Our body naturally can fight inflammation, but we in our society have so much stress that we actually need to supplement. And the way we can do that is with antioxidants. And what we wanna do is find foods that are high in these antioxidants. And those tend to be foods that have flavonoid in them. Flavonoid is a type of antioxidant. It actually fights stress and toxins that are in the body. And it also helps boost serotonin. These are a few of the foods. Oh my goodness, look, chocolate's showing up again. Who knew, right? Um, some other foods that come up, berries, very good. Berries are actually very low in sugar, but high in fiber. So they're, they're great substitute if you're want, looking for something sweet instead of high sugary foods. Also fruits and vegetables that have a lot of color in them. So look for a lot, a lot of reds and orange um, in your foods, because those are carotenoids, which is a subset of flavonoids that are particularly good at boosting mood. And I know you guys are looking at the wine that's in there. Yes, wine is also very good for us. 
Um, it has uh, these flavonoids in it. It also has resveratrol, which is actually considered an anti-aging uh, antioxidant. But I just wanna mention that alcohol also will depress serotonin levels. So we have to be very conscious about how much alcohol is being consumed for a lot of different reasons, but also for our mood. It may boost our mood quickly, but over the long term, we need to be careful. So let's now take a look at foods that support the brain. The brain is made up of 60% of fat. And for that reason, we need to support our brain with healthy fats, not processed fats. So um, every cell of the body, 20% of the cell membrane is made up of a special fat called omega-3 essential fatty acid. So we want to be able to eat foods, consume foods that have a lot of this fatty acid because we can't make that fatty acid ourselves. We need to consume it. We need to get it from our food or from supplements. Um, again, fish is a great source for this as well as kale and chia and walnuts. Walnuts is a great source of omega-3 as an, one of the highest of nuts. So again, I, I will send this slide out to you so you'll have a list there for yourself. Let's then take a look at our last um, line here, which is a healthy microbiome. And if you've heard me talk before, you know I've talked about what a microbiome is. A microbiome is simply the collection of the millions of trillions of cells that live on and inside of our body. And in fact, there are more of these organisms on our body and in our digestive tract than are in the cells, the actual cells of our bodies themselves. So we need to treat these cells well. We need to culture them. We need to cultivate them to make sure that we have healthy microorganisms in our gut. Because remember, we get back to that gut access, the gut brain access. We want our gut to be happy and be sending happy signals up to our brain. So these microbes that live in our gut, again, I said, have a direct communication with the brain via, the, via that vagus nerve that I mentioned before. And studies have been shown that people who um, have depression actually have a different makeup of microorganisms in their gut than people who tend to be happy. So what we want to do is we want to cultivate those happy microorganisms. And it turns out that one of the microorganisms that helps most with mood is lactobacillus. And lactobacillus happens to be that organism that makes sauerkraut and dill pickles. So fermented foods are a great source of these microorganisms, uh, micro, uh, also known as probiotics that we want in our gut. These uh, organisms, again, here are other foods. There's yogurt and kefir. A lot of these different fermented foods carry microorganisms that are actually beneficial to us. Why? Because they can actually help us digest foods. When they digest foods in our gut, they're releasing some of those vitamin B vitamins that I was saying were so important. They're releasing enzymes and hormones um, that we need. So we want to encourage their growth. How do you do that? You do that by eating fiber-rich foods. Remember I talked about fiber-rich foods being important to slow down sugar consumption and help with the sugar, leveling out sugar levels. Well, they are also helping in our gut because they're feeding that healthy probiotic and releasing all of those healthy nutrients into our gut. So even though we can't digest fiber ourselves, these bacteria are doing the work for us. So we want to encourage that by consuming foods that have these microbes in them. So I know that's a lot to digest, pardon the pun, but um, <laughs> there are, these foods are good for us and they help boost our mood. Just in general, the foods we should be eating just to review, whole foods that are high in fiber and healthy fats to help regulate our energy levels, right? 
We want colorful fruits and vegetables that have pro um, uh, phytonutrients in them that help fight oxidation. We want foods that are high in tryptophan, vitamin Bs and magnesium to help with the serotonin levels, right? And foods high in omega-3 fatty acids to help our brain and fatty uh, fermented foods to help that microbiome. All of these things are going to make us happier. So what are some of these foods? Just in summary, like that I kept going through, these are just some of the foods you might wanna think about adding into your diet. Sweet potato or avocado. Sweet potato has those carotenoids in them. So much of that avocado has healthy fat and fiber. We've got our dark chocolate. That one came up a lot. I mean, it has the tryptophan and magnesium in it, right? Um, pumpkin seeds also came up a lot. Green leafy vegetables. Any kind of green leafy vegetable is good. Spinach and kale, very good. Walnuts and flaxseed were great plant sources of omega-3 fatty acids. Berries, very good source. They're sweet. They have antioxidants that are so good for us, but they're also full of fiber. So we want to include those as well. Salmon, sardines, and mackerel have another source of omega-3. And citrus fruits are very high in vitamin C, which is very helpful for our mood as well. So a lot to think about. I know, boy, I went through that pretty quickly. Um, so I just wanted to go through then and maybe let's get to our foods that we are going to be making tonight. By the way, um, when Roz sends you the link that has the slides for tomorrow and the follow-up, um, I, I will also be offering some follow-up recipes. If you'd like to do that, she will also include a link where you can sign up for my newsletter as well. It's a free monthly newsletter with uh, tips on healthy eating and lifestyle habits, as well as some follow-up recipes like these from tonight. So we'll be making tonight a chicken sweet potato and lentil curry. And you can see from the list down here, all of the good ingredients that are mood boosting in it. It's simple and easy to make, it tastes delicious. And then of course, because that chocolate showed up so much, I thought it would be fun to do a healthy mousse that we're also going to make with avocado, which is also one of those healthy mood boosters. So without further ado, I am going to set up my recipes here. So I'm ready to do that. I have all my ingredients. If I have people following along, um, please, by all means, have your ingredients out um, so that we can move along. I don't want to lose anybody. Let me unshare my screen. Okay, and I am back. Wonderful. So, Roz, do we have any questions on that or are we doing okay? Uh, we did have a couple questions. Okay. Um, one, someone wanted to know, do these foods offer the same benefits if they are cooked? Yes. In fact, there's some foods such with the, the carotenoids that are actually better because the antioxidants are released when they are actually cooked. So tomatoes have some antioxidants in it, same thing. So yes, cooking um, can, you know, some, it depends on what it is that they're giving. There are some uh, antioxidants that might be more fragile, but in general, um, you're getting a benefit from them if they're cooked or if they're raw as well. And we had one other question. Someone writes, I've been eating a smothered cabbage soup. It contains fresh cabbage, apple cider vinegar, and chicken broth. Would this be a sort of substitute for sauerkraut? Um, actually it is not, but it does have a lot of fiber in it, which will help that microbiome. So that will help your mood, uh, just for that. What it doesn't have is it doesn't have those live microbes in it that will be feeding the gut. So what, the, and that's a really good question because a lot of times people buy sauerkraut in the grocery store. And if you were buying your sauerkraut in the aisle, where they're not refrigerated, they've been cooked. And once you cook the sauerkraut after the fermentation has happened, the, it, the bugs, the healthy bugs are being killed off. 
they have to do that because if they don't do that, the bugs keep growing and the container can explode because they give off um, gas in the process, lactic, uh, the lactic acid, CO2 and lactic acid cause it, it to explode. So when, if you are shopping for your pickles or your sauerkraut, you, would, you need to be looking in the refrigerated section. We have two more questions, even then we'll, then we'll get going. We'll quickly okay. recipes. Sounds good. Lisa I love wants it. to know: Does chicken have as much tryptophan as turkey? Um, you know, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know whether it's just that we eat so much turkey on Thanksgiving that that's why it's become known for that. But um, it, it actually, uh, beef actually has more tryptophan than the uh, than poultry does. So, and I think it also depends on what part of the turkey you're eating as well. I'm not quite sure, but, oh, that's a good one. You know what? I, that's one for me to look up. Maybe, maybe you know, if I can get the answer to that before you send out your uh, letter okay. to everybody tomorrow. Right. Okay. And then just the last question uh, that we're going to take right now is, what is the difference between tofu and tempeh? Oh, and tempeh. Tempeh. Uh, it's the, it, they're both made with soy. They're both fermented. Tempeh tends to have more of a um, texture to it. Um, I believe that the soy is actually um, extracted more than the tempeh, but I think it's a different fermentation process. Uh, and the way they make soy today is different. It's not the, the old fashioned fermenting that, that used to go on. There are still artisanal if you can call that tofu, where they will do that. But um, they use, with, with tofu, they actually use calcium to um, have everything settle out. So it's, it's a very different process, even though they both start out with soy. I'm, okay, not, so I'm not an expert on it, but that's my understanding. All right, that's okay. Okay, that's, I'm gonna turn my camera back off again and we'll get to some cooking. All right, sounds great. And thank you for those questions. I love them. Uh, Roz, if anything comes up as I'm going along, please feel free to, to interrupt me. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the chicken and sweet potato and lentil curry. I gave the option to do both an Instant Pot method or a stovetop. I'm gonna do the stovetop today. Um, and if we don't quite finish it, that's okay. We'll, we'll get enough of it done so you'll get to see how the, how the process is made. I'm going to start out with an, just frying up and sauteing up an onion. Glad you can all, hopefully all see my cutting board. Uh, I've got one of these onions that are difficult to cut or difficult to, to peel off the skin. Sometimes when that happens, I actually will take the edge of the knife and just kind of go along the edge. And it just takes that papery film off the top. I'm gonna to do that with this one as well. There we go. You see how that works? I don't know why sometimes they're more stubborn than others. I'm going to want to do the onion in, oh, not, it doesn't have to be finely chopped. So what I'm going to do, I cut it in half. What I will do is I start from the end that has the, where the um, stem was coming out and I'll leave the root side intact and I'll just cut down through. I did about three times and I'll cut across horizontally. And then I will just do a rough chop. And I realized that I wanted to bring my cooktop over to you so you can see. So I'm going to move my portable cooktop over here instead of using my oven. And I'm going to use a Dutch oven I use my Dutch oven all the time. And while I'm chopping this onion, I'm going to heat up a little bit of olive oil. Usually I like to get the pot 
hot before I add my olive oil. I'm trying to speed things up a little bit, but hopefully that won't be a problem. All right. And again, if, let's see, I wanna make sure you can see me. I'm gonna cut through and then I'm gonna cut through this way and just do a rough chop. And I'll show you a little bit about the size of the, the dice so you get an idea of the size. All right, I wanna get that browning. So I'm gonna put that right into my pot. Did get a chance to heat up. I had the hot top heating while I was talking. And I'm gonna grab a little spatula here. Just stir that around, get that cooking. So what I wanna to, want to do is I just wanna get that start to soften. And while that is softening, it'll probably take about three minutes or so. Um, I wanna get out my chicken. Let me grab my chicken. I have it in the refrigerator. This is why I love cooking from my kitchen. I could just go into the refrigerator and grab what I need. So I did clean the chicken earlier. Um, I got this from Trader Joe's. It's an organic free range chicken. I like to try to buy the my meats as fresh as possible. And I will use just another cutting board here so I don't contaminate my cutting board with the, the meat. It's kind of a nice little luxury to be able to do that. What I like to do is just clean up a little bit by taking off some of the fat that's left on. I actually grew up, my dad was a butcher. Um, so I would go into the butcher shop on the weekends and help him. We got to do the, the cash register, but we got to watch him cutting meats and learning that sometimes there's fat hidden in the meats that need to be cut off. So I don't, I don't go crazy trying to cut all of it off. I know that this is a cleaner. This animal has been raised cleanly. Um, and the fats on these tend not to harbor as many toxins as other conventionally raised meats but that is where the toxins will be stored in us too. All right, so this is browning nicely. I'm going to cut the chicken now into bite-sized pieces. I would say, oh, you know, maybe one by two inches. I just want them small enough that when, you know, when you're eating, you don't feel like you have to take a knife to it. You can just spoon it into your mouth. <laughs> this is about a pound of chicken. And what I'm gonna do then is I'm going to add this in with my garlic. Again, I hope you can see the pieces that I'm doing. It's a little bit, a little bit small, but I'll hold it up so you can see when I'm done. say they're probably about one inch cubes. And I'm gonna put that right in with my onion, which has begun to soften. Just wash my hands here. And 
I'm going to grab my garlic and ginger. So, what I love when I'm doing my garlic, I don't know if you can see, but I still even just have the paper all around this garlic clove. I'm gonna take the side of my knife and just give it a good smash. And what you'll see is it will break up that paper and the paper comes right off. I'm gonna smash this other clove. Be careful with your fingers. I always keep my fingers up when I'm doing it. But you'll see that even before I've started chopping, this clove now has broken up into pieces. So I'm just, all I need to do is do a rough chop on, chop on this now. And I have some pretty small pieces. And that's good enough to go right into my pot. All right, where did, here we go. Okay. I'm gonna let this, basically what we wanna do is we wanna get the chicken to brown. While it is browning, I am going to now take my ginger. This little trick about ginger. So if you have a spoon, you know, it's always so hard to peel the ginger, the skin off the ginger. What you can do is you can just take a spoon, literally, and scrape the ginger. And it will clean the skin right off of the ginger. So let me see how much ginger I actually needed here. One tablespoon. Okay. So I'm going to take about an inch of this. And we'll see how, how much that makes. So what I'm going to do is I, I cut off about an inch. I'm going to cut off slices going across. There's, there's like little fibers in ginger. So what I want to do is I want to cut across those fibers just to, to break them up. And then what I'm going to do is lay the slices down and chop them. And again, this is going to be cooked down. So I just don't want, I just want the pieces small enough that you don't get a mouthful of ginger in one bite. All right, so here's my ginger. I'm gonna add that in. Give it a stir. Cooking up nicely here. And while that is browning, I can now go to my carrots and sweet potato. Remember, those were some of our feel good foods, as is the chicken. So we're adding in some of these really good feel good foods. What I'm going to do, I have organic uh, carrots here. I don't tend to peel organic ca carrots. Um, I just wash them really well and I just let it go because I figure they've been growing in a organic medium. Um, see, how do I want to chop these? I'm just slicing them into like quarter inch pieces. I'm going to give it a minute until I add them. I'm going to let this brown a little bit. So let me just put this in a bowl while we're waiting. So look at that beautiful orange color. Remember I was talking about the more color the better off. And it's good to do variety. You don't want to do all carrots. You want to do carrots one day. You want to do squash another day because each color has a different antioxidant in it and it's giving you different healing properties. So sweet potato. 
Now, usually, usually I don't necessarily peel uh, my sweet potatoes. Um, this one kind of looked a little gnarly, <laughs> for better, lack of a better word. So I thought maybe I would peel it. Usually I leave the skin on because it has a lot of fiber in it. And a lot of the antioxidants in a vegetable are found in the outer cover, the outer skin. Alrighty, we got a peeled sweet potato here. I like to just cut off the ends. And by the way, I'm saving my scraps because I use them in compost. Or what I will do is for things like onions, um, garlic. Uh, well, I don't usually have garlic, but onions and uh, celery and carrot ends. I'll put them in the freezer and I'll make it into broth when I'm cooking up. If I have chicken bones, I'll throw those in. And I'll make like a bone broth. So it's nice. I always have that available. So what I did was I cut the sweet potato in slices and I'm, I'm gonna make it into a little stack here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop down twice. So I have little French fry type shapes. I'm gonna turn it 90 degrees and I'm gonna do the same thing. So that all of a sudden then I have nicely shaped pieces of my sweet potato. And I'm going to do that with the entire potato until they're all chopped. I hear my chicken cooking away here. Let me give it a stir. Ah, starting to brown nicely. By the way, if you're browning something and it starts to burn on the bottom, you can just add a little bit of liquid, whether it's a little bit of broth or a little bit of water, and that will help loosen up what's sticking to the bottom and keep it from burning on you. This burner is not quite as good as my stove in terms of evenness of heating, so I've got to keep an eye on it. All right. Little end pieces, I'll just cut into four instead of doing as many slices across. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to stir up this chicken. Let me hold it up for you so you can see. I might leave this to go a little bit longer so that the chicken browns a little bit more. But in the interest of time, I think it's good enough. We're going to go ahead with it. So what I would like to do is start adding in my spices. So I have here cumin, turmeric. By the way, turmeric is a great antioxidant. Remember, we were talking about um, antioxidants helping inflammation. So this is also very good for fighting inflammation. Cumin, yeah, some people don't think of spices as being healthful, but they really do have a lot of healthy attributes to them. So let's see. So I want two teaspoons each of cumin and coriander. All right, and one teaspoon each of garam masala. Garam masala is just a spice mix, an Indian spice mix. So let's see, I'm gonna do two teaspoons of my, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add in the spices so that I can brown them a little bit with the chicken before I add in any broth. It's nice to kind of get them to cook a little bit. I just kind of wiped my teaspoon off in between because I don't like to, don't want to mix my 
or dirty up my spices with other spices. Um, yeah. And I'm gonna add in a teaspoon of my turmeric then. Oh, you know what? And then the curry powder, I didn't pull that out. I need to go grab that. So I have um, my garam masala. Oops. Doesn't fit in the jar. We'll have to do it this way. And a teaspoon of that. I love this spice. Oh, it's such a great spice blend. All right. Let me grab my curry. Okay. And I think we need a table, two tablespoons of curry powder. All right. Oh, this is smelling so good. Oh, I wish you could smell this. Oh, used up the last of my curry. Perfect. And I actually have a uh, red chili powder that I'm going to add in just about a quarter teaspoon. This is, this is great. I just got this from my um, son and daughter-in-law. It's a red chili powder or Thai chili powder. No, red chili powder. Um, has a wonderful flavor to it. And they got it at an Asian market. Asian markets are a great place for looking for different spices, different peppers. Oh my goodness, they have such a selection. Oh, this smells delicious. All right, so now I have my spices browning, toasting nicely. They cook a little bit. You know, so they don't have as raw a, a flavor in them. And I'm going to add in my chopped vegetables. Whoa, just save that one. All right. And I'm going to just toast those up. All right, now, Give that a second to, to cook. If I was, again, if I was doing this on my own, I might leave a few more minutes for this to, to be cooking. But in the interest of time, let's add in now our tomatoes. I have some organic diced tomatoes here. I actually got it from Costco, um, PBA free cans. They use a plastic liner for tomatoes, especially tomatoes because they're so acidic, but you have to be careful that it doesn't have the bisphenol A in it. Okay. Let that stir up. Remember tomatoes, one of those good mood foods, as is the carrots and the sweet potatoes. And the lentils. And tonight, today what we're going to do is we're going to work with these red lentils. Red lentils cook up a lot quicker than the green or the brown lentils. They're a lot more tender. I'm going to put in a half cup of our lentils. Let me show them to you. They're a lot smaller than um, the brown or the red, uh, brown or the green. Um, I, I think I read somewhere that they're actually shelled. I don't know whether, whether that's true or not. I'll have to check on that one again. And then I have some homemade turkey stock leftover from, that I made from my leftover turkey for Thanksgiving. And I'm gonna add that in, two cups of that. Actually, a bone broth because I could take the carcass and just let it cook and cook, which I love. Now, I'm just going to stir this up. It smells delicious. And what I'm going to do now, if this was an instant pot, I would have started browning everything right in the instant pot on the saute function. 
up to this point. I would turn the saute function off at this point and then put the high pressure cooking on for 15 minutes. But since I'm doing it this way, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transfer this over to my stove behind me on a low heat. And I'm going to let that cook. Typically this would cook for about 25 minutes to a half hour. It all depends on how um, soft the sweet potatoes get that uh, kind of dictates when it's ready. Now, so what I'm gonna do is while this is going on, I am going to go right to making our dessert, which is a avocado mousse, as I mentioned. Let me move this off. And we will get back to this because we do have a few more ingredients. What I wanna do is I wanna add so much some more of that mood boosting food. I wanna add a, a bunch of spinach. So I'm gonna add that in um, as well as a little bit of lime juice and um, some coconut milk to make it nice and thick and creamy. So, but in the meantime, we can get started with the dessert. If we have time, what I will do is I'll make up a quick batch of collie rice for the curry and show you how that's done as well. So let me bring over my little food processor. This is such an easy dessert to make and it is guest worthy. Um, they'll never believe that it's, it's a no cook uh, mousse that you're making. All right, so let me just move some of these wonderful spices out of the way. Get some room in here for our dessert. Now, this is also a great way to add some sweetness into your, your food, into your diet without going to processed foods and overdoing the sweetness. So I tend to not add a lot of sweeteners to my desserts to my recipes. You may want to adjust it to your palate. I would encourage you to stop, start backing off and experimenting and seeing what your taste buds adapt to because that's what really happens. You start, when you start reducing the amount of sugar in your diet, your taste buds will actually change. Just wanted to clean off that knife that I was using. All right. So key ingredient in this is avocado. So I wonder how many of you, I wish you, normally I say, okay, give me a show of hands. You know, how many of you cut open avocados? Um, did you know that avocado, avocados are, ah, very good, Jessica, I see you. Thanks, that's awesome. Two, okay, wonderful, excellent. All right, Margaret, I gotcha, thanks for that. I love, I love getting that feedback, that's great. So um, in order to cut, oh, I was gonna say that an avocado has, is one of a, a large number of emergency room visits for people because they cut their hands when they're opening up the avocado. So I wanna show you the way that I tend to, to do it. Um, I will use a larger knife just to cut around, but after that, all I use is a butter knife because when you're, I'm cutting like this, I don't wanna cut my hand. So what I do is I go one direction and then I turn it 90 degrees and I do another direction so that I get a nice checkerboard pattern like that. And then what I'll do is I'll just take a spoon and I will scoop it out. So I just have chunks. And I'll do this if I'm doing a salad as well. It works perfectly for that as well. I know there are little gizmos that help you do it, but 
I find that this works just fine for me. Now, here's the tricky part. So now you still have this little pit that's still here. This one is very little. What I will do is I'll take the knife and I'll just go like that with the top of my hand and twist it. And it comes right out. No emergency room visits here, okay? And again, I'm going to do the crisscross pattern. I'll put that right into my food processor. Okay, there we go. Come back here, you guys, to the container. All right, so we've got that now. What I want to do is introduce you to cacao. Um, again, show of hands, how many have used cacao versus cocoa before? Okay, all right, Rina, I see you. Another, okay, good, wonderful, excellent. Margaret, I see. Oh, good. I'm so glad. Very good. Cacao is nothing more than unprocessed cocoa. So it actually has more, sorry, I held up the, the cocoa nibs. I meant to help hold up my cacao powder, but it's the same. They're both cacao. It's just that they have not been processed so that they retain more of their antioxidants, right? Those phenols that are so important. Uh, in them, and or flavonoids, um, it has fiber, which is good for us as well. Um, okay, and I want to put in now two tablespoons. It has a similar flavor. Um, I know some people say it tastes different to them. I don't see that much of a of a difference. All right, so I have my cocoa added. Now I'm going to add a little bit of honey just to add a little bit of sweetness. I'm gonna add one tablespoon of honey in. This is some um, raw honey uh, from Wisconsin, fairly local to me, to you guys too, I'm sure, even closer than I am. Woo! All right. Now this is going to make two servings. So you're getting about a teaspoon and a half of honey per serving, which is, that's a fair amount of sweetener. For me, at least, like where I try to avoid adding a lot of sugars. All right, so I have my honey added. I'm going to add a teaspoon in of vanilla extract now. Right, teaspoon of vanilla extract, and I'm going to add in a quarter cup of almond milk. Now you can use any kind of nut milk that you like. I like the almond milk. The almond is also another one of those nice mood boosting foods. So I'm gonna use a little bit of that and I'm going to use a little bit of almond butter as well. So I'm going to add in a couple teaspoons of the almond butter. This happens to be a Trader Joe's. I actually went to Trader Joe's to get a lot of the foods for this evening's meals. I like Trader Joe's because they do have the organic produce. They have um, great prices on things like nut butters and coconut milk. They have a great coconut milk. It's organic. It doesn't have added um, thickeners in it. It's just coconut and water and it's organic and it's a great price. So gee, I wish I was getting a kickback from Trader Joe's. <laughs> okay. All right. And I'm going to add about a quarter of a teaspoon of sea salt. All right, and guess what? That's it. 
we now just need to blend that all up and we will have a wonderful just push it down a little bit Oh, that machine likes to talk. <laughs> All right. I'm going to push it down one more time. Sorry, bear with me. Bear with the noise. One more time. All right. And this is a wonderful, as I said, dessert that you can serve company. And you don't have to tell them how easy it is to, to put together. But let's see. So let me just wipe off this cutting board. That in there. Now, to make it even more of a mood booster, I'm going to add some blueberries. And this is the fun part. You can add whatever you like to the top, or you can just have it just as is. I did bring out um, some of those cacao nibs, which is just raw cocoa. that I love to put in because it gives a little bit of a crunch. You could add some coconut flakes. And there you have this wonderful Mousse. I mean, it's really just so thick and creamy. Those coconut flakes are getting in the way. But isn't that great? Awesome. Oops, I'm going to have to taste all that. Mm, 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 mm. I think you're going to like that. Awesome. So let me, we're coming, we're coming up on the hour here. So what I would like to do is just take a look, quick look back at our curry and see how it's going. Let me bring it over in front here for you to look at. All right, now, excuse me for that noise. This isn't quite done because, well, let's just take a look. Let's see how firm those sweet potatoes are. Yeah, the sweet potatoes are still hard. I would keep this cooking and keep it simmering, but what I would like to do right now just to show you is add in those last ingredients that need to go in to finish up the dish so that you can see what what it looks like so at this point we want to add in those last final ingredients let me go get those all right so what i have is my line now what i'm going to do is to release the juices in the lime. I like to roll it on the table. I 
I'm going to cut it. And then what I like to do is take a fork and break up the juice cells by just stabbing it. And you know, sometimes you can actually see the juices release. If it's a, whoops, I just got squirt in the eye. Um, if it's a really juicy lime, it will, or lemon, it, you could see it just releasing then. But I'm just gonna squeeze that directly in. And I'm gonna do that to the second half. Okay. And then I am going to add in my spinach. I think I've got about two cups, which to me is like two good handfuls. I'm going to stir that in a little bit. Normally I would just put this back on and you know let it wilt. It will wilt just from the heat of the curry that's here now. show you what I have so far. Now what's nice about this is, remember I was talking about the color, we're starting to get some of that color in. Remember spinach, green leafy vegetables, great mood boosters. What I'm going to do is add in a little bit of coconut milk. This recipe calls for about a can. So I'm just going to, now, if you haven't worked with canned coconut milk before, sometimes this is what happens. It separates. So you've got a lot of the fats on the top and the liquid on the bottom. And I'm just going to add that right in. Once it gets into the heat of the curry, it's going to melt and mix in. And that's what's gonna give you that nice thick sauce. That's so great. And so this curry is great to serve over a uh, brown rice, a uh, quinoa. And what I was going to, if we had time, I was going to do a cauli rice. You can buy frozen cauli rice. All you do is heat it up in a pan. If you want to make your own cauli rice, so easy to do. You just take a head of cauliflower and you pulse it in your food processor until it's the size of grain, rice grains. And then you saute it in a pan with a little bit of oil. Um, I like to add a little bit of parsley to it. Um, you could add in onion if you want to, depending on how you're using it. Here is our curry. So let me grab a bowl. And ladle it out. for you to see. There you go. All right, you can put a little bit of cilantro or parsley as a garnish on it. Although this has so much color in it, you don't really even need to do that. So I'm gonna let this one cook on the stove for a little bit longer. 
And you know, the nice thing about the coconut milk is it's not like dairy. You can still, you can still cook it and not worry about it separating the way dairy might do. So here we have our finished dishes. We have our mousse. and our curry. All great mood boosters, great comfort foods, which is so, so important right now. So I'm hoping you guys are staying safe and staying healthy. And I hope I get to see you in person the next time that we meet. Um, did we have any questions, Roz? Hi, we do have some questions. Um, let's see. So someone would like to know your opinion on the difference between jarred minced garlic and fresh garlic. Someone writes that she, her husband seems to think that there's a difference in the taste. And um, what, is, what is your thoughts on that? Um, I think there's definitely a difference in the flavor, uh, but I still, I actually have jarred garlic in a pinch. If I have time, and it's really not hard to, to chop up, you know, if you're smushing it the way I do, um, to use fresh garlic. Um, it, it's actually better to, to break up the garlic to get the benefits of the, the antioxidants and whatnot. But, um, you know, in a pinch, jarred garlic is okay. It, it also has preservatives in it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's adding extra things to, to it that you don't get when you get the fresh garlic. What's nice about the fresh garlic is it's in its own container until you break it open. Once you break it open, it starts to start degrading. So I'm sure that there's some of that degradation going on in the jarred garlic as well. So health-wise, fresh garlic is always the best, but even I have something in the fridge, you know, to have on hand. Someone here has my, a husband, very... my husband likes to buy the, the jarred yeah. <laughs> Um There's a couple of questions about the the mousse. Someone would like to know, this is a good question, can the mousse be stored in the fridge for a couple of days or does it need to be eaten immediately because it is avocado? Um, you know, it does, it does keep in the refrigerator. Um, you know, I think like any, like everything else, if you put like a saran wrap over it so air doesn't get to it, it would keep longer. Um, but it, it will keep um, I, I'm trying to think how long I've had it in before. You know, I would say a day or two, uh, but, but it needs to be sealed nicely so that it's not exposed to the air. You know, avocado will start changing color, although, you know, it's hard to tell if it changes color. This is actually a great way to use up an avocado that doesn't look so great either, because once it's mixed up with the cocoa, you can't tell that it was going, you know, that it was very ripe. Someone here has a question who wants to know about the cacao. Um, is that something you can purchase at just like Mariano's or Jewel or do you have to buy it someplace special? Um, I'm trying to think, I got uh, this at Trader Joe's. You can buy it at Mariano's, you can buy it at Whole Foods for sure. You can go on Amazon and get it. Um, any whole, uh, health food store will carry it. So yeah, it, it's gotten pretty mainstream. It, with Mariano's, you, you might have to hunt a little bit, you know, maybe look in their gourmet or their gluten section, gluten-free section, because it's, it's, you know, a lot of people who cook gluten-free will probably be cooking with, with the cacao as well. But it, it is, it's pretty, pretty well distributed these days. And we have a question about the curry dish. Um, I'd like to know, is it spicy? Um, I don't tend to make it very hot, spicy, uh, because I'm not real tolerant of it. It depends. It depends on your curry mix and it depends on, you know, if you decide to add in additional, you know, red, uh, pepper flakes or red pepper, red chili powder, uh, how hot it. Now, if my son was making this, he'd probably put in a whole like tablespoon of this, uh, because he likes it hot. Uh, I would say that, you know what, I'm going to taste it right now and I'll tell you about the, the spiciness of it. I wish I could serve it to you guys so you'd know. Yeah, this is not giving me heat, which is, you know, a lot of times 
if, if I get something at an Indian restaurant would be too hot. Now, if, if someone likes it hotter, you can always ramp it up by the ingredients that you use. What I used right now, it is not, it's not a, a heat of a spice. It has lots of flavor, has lots of curry flavor to it, but not heat. Okay, so um, I think we answered everyone's questions that posted them um, from this evening. And so I think just lots of nice messages that they enjoyed the program. Oh, I'm so um, <laughs> And you know, also too, if there, if anyone is interested, I have a website, evschwag.com, where I have tons of recipes, lots of blogs on healthy eating that what you, what I tend to like to do is educate and then give you a recipe. So a lot of my blogs are just like that. And tomorrow I'll be putting out a blog of five underrated superfoods that should be on your table. So you might want to take a look, you know, give me a chance to put it up. <laughs> I was doing this today instead of that. So, um, but it, it, it's there and there's lots of, I, I put out a blog every month. So, and it, if you're interested, my newsletter includes the blog as well as some other interesting things that, um, that I find interesting. I call them uh, health shorts as well as um, other upcoming events that are going okay, on. Okay, we'll make sure everybody has the link to join your newsletter. I'll send it out tomorrow along with the video. That's great. And the Thank handout. You so much for doing it. Oh, um, and I appreciate it. I meant the slides, the slides. We'll make sure we send the slides with it. Um, so anyhow, okay, well, anyhow, Evie, thank you so much for joining us tonight and for letting us into your kitchen and the beautiful demonstration. Uh, and um, thank you to everyone for joining us. We hope that you, uh, you enjoyed the program and that you take some of these ideas and you try using them in your home. It was so amazing. thanks everyone. Um, have a good night. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Roz. <laughs>